I'm Eric Schatzker and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today I'm talking to Brookfield CEO Bruce Flatt. He's always been a contrarian, leaning into the out of favor, buying what others want or need to sell. The pandemic is no exception. There will be consolidation and the better and the best will get better and the worst will go away. And Fifth Avenue uh, in New York and Bond Street in London, these will still be amazing places. Bruce turned Brookfield into one of the world's largest alternative asset managers. This is what he thinks the future holds in store. Everyone will be back in the office before you know it. The world's great cities will emerge stronger than ever. Real estate is about to be repriced way higher. Brookfield can double its assets to $1 trillion in just five years. Here's my conversation with Bruce Flatt. Bruce, the Brookfield name is synonymous with big city skyscrapers and suburban malls. You know the consensus view. The consensus view is that demand for space in office towers is never going back to pre-pandemic levels, and bricks and mortar retail is doomed now that everybody is buying everything online. Is that really the future? So first I'd start with, I thought the Brookfield name was synonymous of being one of the largest asset managers in the world. <laughs> that too. So, but if you want to get into office and retail um, comments, here's what I'd say. This too all shall pass. And uh, I just tell you that many of the businesses we're in um, are great because as long as you have staying power, and enormous amounts of liquidity, which we tend to try to build up when times are good and wait for the moments when they're not so good. These are some of the great businesses to be in. And uh, there have been wars, there have been explosions, there have been events um, in cities, there have been floods, and you name it, you can pick them all. They happen in New York Terrorist City. Terrorist attacks. Uh, we've got one across the street from where we're sitting. And all of those things pass. And great cities are great cities because they're great cities. And people will be back in them. In fact, they're back in them today more than they were. And we should all remember back to March. Everyone was shut down. Today, we're back in the offices every single day. Uh, the numbers are increasingly higher of people going into offices, people opening up more things around the world. And we're just learning to live with, um, with this situation. And uh, yes, eventually we'll have a uh, vaccine. But until then, we're just going to have to live with two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, two steps back, one step forward, one step forward. And, uh, and that's what's happening in the world. And these, these will be great still. I don't think we've met a legitimate corporation or legitimate CEO that doesn't want their people back in the office. Some have a third back, some have a quarterback, some have a halfback, some have, we have all our people back. Um, but this floor we're on, we built out the space to accommodate getting all of our people back. But they all want their people back. There's two reasons they don't have them all back. Number one, they don't have enough space to be able to accommodate them in the premises that they occupy and um, uh, run, operate out of today. If they have a vaccine, they don't have to build out more space. If they don't have a vaccine, they're going to have to build out more space, which means there's, you need more space to accommodate the people back. But everyone wants their people back. That's one narrative, right? That's the narrative that says humans are social creatures who need to interact with one another in the same space to be productive, to be creative. The other narrative, which I know you're also familiar with, says there's no need to co-locate people. They can be just as effective working on a virtual platform. It's Bruce Flatt versus Mark Zuckerberg. Who's right? All of those companies that you're suggesting. Sure, could be, could have, be have, Twitter, could be Slack, could be Facebook. They've all been taking more space in urban locations to social distance their people. They're expecting their people back. And early on, they were probably hoping that some more would stay home so they could sell more services to them, more cloud computing, more online apps and all those kind of things. But today, even they, they are all, they're the largest new consumers of space in the markets and they're taking space today. So I don't believe that's 
any of that is the case. And in fact, I, 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 I'm entirely convinced that you go out on the street and ask nine out of 10 people, they will say they want to work from the office. And, and the fact the efficiencies are not even close when people aren't in the office because you get distracted with a hundred of other things. This too shall pass is not the same as we're going back to the old normal. We're going into a new normal. Tell me a bit about the new normal. How has the pandemic changed your business, not just real estate, the rest of your business too? And what does the future look like? We're just in a large recession. It happens to be caused by a health crisis. Everyone gets caused by something different. Nobody, everyone used to say, two years ago, people would say, what's gonna cause the next recession? Lo and behold, I don't think anyone said pandemic. Maybe a few, but nobody believed them. What it does is accelerate trends that are happening. And I'll give you three that, um, that affect us. And, and there's lots of others, but three that affect us. Number one, governments across the world have spent enormous, enormous amounts of money on this situation. And they do, they always do that when recessions happen, but this time it's off the charts as to how much they've spent. And there's only two ways to recoup that money. Tax more or sell assets. And when, they, when I say sell assets, what, the, what that means for government is infrastructure. So our infrastructure business, and we've been saying this for 10 years, the infrastructure business is going to grow very significantly, and especially when governments decide that all infrastructure has to get outsourced to private hands. That has to occur now. So infrastructure globally is going to, it was going to take 50 years, maybe it only takes 25 now to shift all infrastructure from government's funding to private hands. Number two, renewables uh, in the world was with solar costs coming down and with wind technology getting better, cost structures um, are at a situation where you can produce uh, electricity at or near what, what you would produce it with other technologies. And the shift The old toward, stuff, you mean fossil fuels. Yes, the, the shift towards renewal, renewables in this new environment that we, we're in is going to be even accelerated out of this whole situation. And third, this was, it was happening, but this is exponentially changing it, uh, is the data infrastructure being cloud storage and the transmission of um, electrons and you know, what your phone works on, what computers work on, what the internet works on, all of the things and the backbone behind data infrastructure are turning out to be very, very significant opportunities. These are t uh, five, ten trillion dollars of investment that needs to go into this infrastructure and that's going to be accelerated out of all of this because while I say people are going to be in the office, many more things are going to be done on the backbone of the global infrastructure out there and, um, and that, that will be accelerated by all of this. In the meantime, of course, Bruce, most people can't see beyond the tip of their noses. So let's talk about some of the things that give people anxiety at the moment. We talked about offices, and it sounds to me like you're pretty confident that companies are going to find ways to get people back into their buildings. And when they do, they'll probably be sitting further apart than they were before. Is that right? Look, it, yeah, the answer is yes. The bottom line, though, is when I say a trend, what it usually means is high quality things. Yeah. Well, we buy our great high quality things in good cities, in well-located places that have proper ventilation, that have all the things that you would want within your buildings. What this means is probably the tertiary marginal space will get converted to something else because people, they, they won't want to be in it. And, um, but the answer is yes, they're, they're, they are definitely going back on office. What about retail? There are eight and a half billion square feet of retail space in the United States. It's the equivalent, because I wanted to know how much is eight and a half billion square feet. It's almost five Washington DCs. That's how much retail space there is in America. What's going to happen to all that space after the pandemic, or even during the pandemic, right now and in the years ahead? 
So the same thing I just said in office is happening in retail. If you have a poorly located retail center with some tertiary tenants, you're probably going to lose them all and it will get plowed down and become something else. If you have a great center, remember, those tenants need places to go to attract people. And if you have a great center, they're concentrating into it. So the great centers out of all of this, just like everything, there will be consolidation and the better and the best will get better and the worst will go away. And Fifth Avenue uh, in New York and Bond Street in London, these will still be amazing places um, to attract customers and there'll be a demand for that space. That's high street shopping. What about the malls? It's the same thing because these malls are just high street shopping in smaller centers or in suburban locations. If you own the best, if you own the tertiary, if you're in a city and there's eight centers, the four best ones are going to be even better in the future because you're going to get rid of four. And those four, and, and you know, we have 80, per, 80, 90 percent of our value of our retail business is invested in 45 centers. And those centers are super powerful places where people want to be and retailers want to be because they have to, that's where the people are. So your retail business survives the shakeout? Ah, of course, of course. Better than before? Look, it, it, in the short term, it wasn't so great. Last quarter, we were shut down. Today, it's getting much, much better. Numbers are coming back. Some, some centers have sales higher than they were last year on a comparable month. But yes, on an overall basis, yes, it's coming back. And five years from now, it likely will be stronger than it was before. Who else survives the shakeout? And what does the landscape look like after it's over? Look, Simon is a great uh, company, and they're strong, and they will survive this. And they have very good centers. And, um, and there may be a few others. But, but the, the large retail industry, is going to, A, is going to consolidate down to players that are strong. And the retailers are going to compress their stores down, and they're going to be in those great centers. Brookfield has partnered with Simon Properties to buy, if I'm not mistaken, at least three, maybe more than three retailers out of bankruptcy. There was uh, Aeropostale, Forever 21, and most recently, JCPenney. Why? Look, we have the two of us together, uh, but we could, it could be separate, have enormous amounts of information and relationships into the business. Uh, we have the capital to be able to support um, the businesses. And so far with the retailers that we've done that with, we've done extremely well by supporting their businesses. And uh, so we think JCPenney can have a future and it could be actually quite exciting. And, and if you come and see us five years from now, I think odds favor we'll do really well with it. Uh, it's possible we don't. Uh, but it's, uh, it's possible we do really well. We don't want to own every retailer in America, um, but we can learn a lot by, own, by owning some. And it informs our judgment as where do we go, because really what our job is, is deliver goods to people from uh, manufacturers. And sometimes they go through department stores, sometimes those goods go through retailers, and we don't need to own all of them. But selectively uh, owning some of them, we think we can be helpful to our centers and helpful to the, uh, to the marketplace. I'm going to ask you the same question everybody asks about the economy. Right? What does the shape of your recovery look like? And how long does it take before the numbers that matter to you, revenue, cash flow, whatever, get back to where they were circa February of 2020. Yeah, so look, I, I, th we still have businesses that aren't open yet. Uh, we have hotels. It's a small part of our business, but we have uh, hotels that aren't open. But every day, even for those, we're figuring out ways to open them. And uh, we're, for example, we own the Atlantis in Bahamas, and it closed. It's 4,000 rooms. On Paradise Island. On Paradise Island. It has its own island, and we've now negotiated with the government of Bahamas to have a, um, a bubble. We're going to test everyone when they arrive, and we're going to charter planes, and we're flying people in starting December 1. So we will be taking people there. They don't have to quarantine at all. During, going down. Going down. When they come back, they'll quarantine. 
or if they come from a place that doesn't need a quarantine from a bubble free COVID zone, because we're going to keep it that way with all the protocols in place. But I think during the winter time, we're going to have an amazing uh, number of people that'll want to come down there because there aren't that many options. And so we've negotiated this with the government and that's allowed us to open up. So when I started off by saying every day it gets a little bit better, three months ago I couldn't have imagined that. Six months ago we were shutting the place down. So we're now planning on opening it up so that we can bring people in and we'll rotate 4,000 rooms of people with all the safety protocols and they won't have to quarantine. There are doubts, Bruce, about the future of cities. Not whether cities will continue to exist, but how thriving they'll be. Where do you stand? Urban centers for centuries and centuries have been attracting more people for very simple reasons. People like to associate with other people. They like to be the in thing. There are jobs and employment. They can walk to work. They can do all the things that come along with it. And this is not stopping it. In fact, I could, make, I could probably make an argument this is just going to reset it and it's even going to get stronger. Um, but the, the point is these cities are not going away. So anybody that suggests that these cities are going to go away, I think probably hasn't looked at history books and is only reacting to the current situation that's going on um, about suburban housing. And you know, I can tell you, our suburban housing business where we sell residential single family homes to individuals is booming. And uh, we're thrilled with that, um, but I think that's an anomaly at this point in time um, relatively speaking. Bruce, the expectation heading into the spring lockdown was that the pandemic would trigger a tsunami of distressed asset selling. And it hasn't panned out that way. The companies that are going bankrupt are the ones that were in desperate shape before the virus. Is distress coming or not? So I'll go back to March. So March was pretty ugly. And it looked like we were heading into an abyss. Um, the federal government in the United States and virtually all governments in the world that have resources uh, aimed an enormous artillery at the situation at hand and they actually pulled off an incredible job which is that they reflated the bond and equity markets to be able to I, I think float us through a period of time. And, That's and, not a bad way of putting and it. And amazingly it actually they pulled it off. I, mean, I give them amazing credit for pulling off something that I didn't ever think could be accomplished. Now we're here. What people did was borrow, if they were, if they were in bad situations before, they just borrowed too much money. And what's going to have to happen is you have to equitize many things because you either, you, either, you might have made it through, but now the deferrals on your credit card or the deferrals on your mortgage or the deferrals on your rent or the deferrals or the fact is you borrowed too much money and now you have too much debt, it has to be equitized. Some of that means you're going to go through bankruptcies, a, a greater amount of bankruptcies than, than um, uh, you would otherwise have in a period of time, but maybe not as many as you would have had. And secondly, there's going to be re-equitizations that have to happen. And so I think the next 18 months, you're going to see a lot of opportunities in that situation. But what we didn't experience was this. How much money do you have to deploy right now? Dry powder, if you will. Yeah, so our, our corporate balance sheets are maybe 50, between 15 and 20 billion, and our dry powder in the funds is another 50, 60 billion. So it's upwards of 75, 80 billion dollars. And that will be pushed into funds. And we're out, we raise upwards between 50 and $100 billion a year to replenish that. So it, uh, and as we do that, it keeps increasing. And, uh, and so there's very significant amounts of money to put to work. And it'll either go into what you call distressed opportunities, or we'll just keep finding the doubles, singles, doubles, triples 
that we always find within businesses given the broad business that we have. The assets that are performing well now, extremely well in some cases, data centers for example, a business you're in, healthcare properties, another one, renewable energy, are expensive. It's a great time to sell, the prices are high, but you still have to reinvest. How do you find new things to buy at good prices, bargains if you will, the kinds of prices that Brookfield and valuations that Brookfield is known for when there's such a tailwind. In addition to all of the money that's been spent in stimulus, all central banks took their interest rates to zero. And when you take interest rates to zero, you work backward on repricing everything else. And multiples for businesses ought to be higher. Valuations for real estate that are leased ought to be higher. Valuations for data centers ought to be higher. Renewables ought to be higher. All of those things. So the, 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 the capitalization rates or the multiples are coming down, which means the values are going up. And uh, so some of it is, if we're in a zero interest rate world, you may not be right that they have high values. These may be appropriate, and there are pools of money in the world because the alternative is possibly owning a treasury bond. And if you own a treasury bond, you earn one. You're doomed to one. It's possible interest rates go negative and you make some more money, but you're probably doomed to one. Assuming interest rates, at least in this country, don't go negative, is that repricing done? Or no, is it has, still has, happening has, because not enough assets have traded? Hasn't even started. Hasn't even, hasn't even started. started. Just, just starting. We're selling a building in London. It's just starting. And uh, it hasn't started in New York because assets aren't trading because people don't, they're not comfortable yet. The, remember, what you have to have is these are great assets in great cities which have long-tailed streams of income. Even if you have a building that's let for 20 years, people are confused about what that means. But once this clears and interest rates are in a new low, cap rates are going to start coming down. And valuations are going to start? Yes. To where? Give me a sense of, to tell me more. This is. Look, rates could have been 4%. A, a cap rate in a city center uh, office building might have been 4% before. It's probably going to 2 If it's two, If we're in a zero play, interest rate world and people believe that we're going to be in a zero interest rate world for a while and the Federal Reserve's told you that, then um, it, I see no reason for a long tailed asset with 20 years of cash flows not to be at two or two and a half percent. And, if that building and, and, and a point and a half, just for arithmetic, you don't have to do the math right here, but it means a lot to the values. Well, let's of talk a about that. If that building, if that building that was selling at a four percent cap rate prior to the pandemic would have fetched a billion dollars, what's it going to fetch at two percent or one and a half? North of two. It's a billion dollars difference. So I'll give you, here's just a small indication. When we built Manhattan West, we built one tower there, it's called One Manhattan West. It's 100% leased, it's now open, it opened during the pandemic. People might have said, that tower, geez, it's terrible that they opened a tower during the pandemic. Actually, it was fantastic. Because the tower is 100% let to great tenants, its cash flows are, once stabilized, 125 million a year and growing. And we thought we were gonna finance it for 5%. We financed it under 3%. That's $50 million a year to the equity owner. $50 million a year of extra cash flow to the owner of the building. Replicate that across a lot of real estate. That's a lot of value to the owner. So forget about even what it's worth. And the owner in this case is Brookfield the and, and... The owner is us, us and our partner, which is QIA. And, uh, but that, uh, that is a... So you can say, what's the value of something? What you sell it for, it has to, you have to change people's perception if you were going to sell it. But what I can tell you is the cash flow to the owner mm -hmm. is $50 million a year higher than we expected. And that's merely because we just financed it in this interest rate environment. Cash flows are the same. Tenants are the same. 
So that's going to change the values of real estate significantly if you, if you believe we're in a low interest rate environment for a while. The stock market is a discounting mechanism. It tries to forecast the future and set a price for it today. Why hasn't the stock market, in a more meaningful way, started to reprice things like REITs, for example, the kinds of vehicles that have the hard cash flowing assets that you're talking about? You know, it's a good question because probably the greatest discount out there between what you would see as uh, uh, value and price, price versus value, uh, is in uh, real estate securities. Now, first, a lot of the real estate securities that trade out there don't have real estate that is maybe the quality that I'm talking about, but even the ones that do are trading at enormous discounts to their uh, tangible value, let alone if, I'm, if we're right in what I just said. And I think that's because the narrative today by the common media, for what it's worth, is uh, very negative on the things that you asked earlier. They're very negative about office sure. and very negative about retail. And to the extent it's not just the media. That, that's the, the, to, to some degree, the media are a reflection of common perceptions. Yeah, and I think common perceptions are that. They're wrong, but the common perceptions are that, and therefore that's why values are trading that. And I'd say one of the great um, value purchases today, which is buying real estate securities in the marketplace because you're buying them at fractions of what you would trade them at in the private sector. You've decided to get serious about impact investing. Why? We've been in for, before it was called renewables. Um, <laughs> when it was just called hydropower. And we've always had a high um, respect for sustainability because we always believe that buy the best, buy in the best places and own the best things and what came along with that was sustainability pure and simple. We came to the further conclusion over the last couple of years that the energy transition that's going to go on in the world is going to be very, very dramatic. And therefore, we thought of who could we bring in to help us transition to the through the energy tran tran transformation that's going to go on. And we um, brought in Mark Carney to help us. And we think that, that the fund that we can raise around energy transition and what's going to go on in the world can, will be very significant and very impactful to what's going to go on in the world in the next 10, 15 years. So it's, it's, it's a new, I'd say it's a new, it's a new sector for us because it fits with our clients in a new way in their portfolios, but it's wrapping together many of the things that we've done in, in past with the, the knowledge of one of the best in the world in this. That's why you think it can be a $100 billion asset business. Yeah, and probably bigger. Probably bigger. What about insurance? We've looked at and thought about and have small um, businesses uh, in insurance reinsurance uh, today. But our issue was twofold before. Uh, issue number one was that our belief was interest rates were going to continue to come down. As if you reinsure long tail liabilities and, inch, and interest rates come down, you have to somehow outrace the issue of rates came down, you lost money on the way down. Today, interest rates are zero. Yeah, that's not a problem anymore. This, look, it, rates could go negative, and they could go negative forever. I don't think odds favor it. Therefore, we think in sh the time is right to get into the insurance business. Because of what's gone on over the last 10 years, there is capital needed by insurers to insure policies. And therefore, there's opportunity for us to bring capital to the table. And third, and maybe as important, a lot of the um, investments that go into these insurance products, so when you invest on the asset side of the balance sheet, are credit. And we never had the scale credit to be able to manage the capital and today with our Oak Tree partnership we do. And as a result of those three things, we think this could be um, very significant for us. We'll have to see over the next 10 years. Bruce, one of the things I've been struck by is the speed at which Brookfield is growing. Assets have more than doubled in the past five years 
to $550 billion. It took you 10 years to double assets before that. And now you've set out a number of different areas in which you want to expand and grow. How long does it take double assets again? Are you asking, will we have a trillion dollars of assets in five years? Probably. If we don't, if we don't we've chosen not to right. for a specific reason. Like, uh, look, our business is A, make money for our shareholders, and B, make money for our clients. And that's it. We only have, we have two goals in life. Everything else is we should do the right thing. We should do all the things that uh, run business well, all, all of that. But those are our two goals of the organization. And if it means we should grow, we'll grow. If it means we shouldn't grow, we won't grow. And we have to be very cognizant of that in everything we do. But there's one thing that we found in the businesses that we're in. Scale matters. And when you buy things, there aren't that many people that have the amount of capital that we have to be able to compete. And when you deal with governments, and when you deal with constituents, and you deal with clients, scale matters. And, uh, and that has meant, as a result of that, that's meant that we should grow and offer them more products. And the industry has been consolidating into larger amounts with less people. Luckily, we're one of those. And that's meant that we should grow. Some people would say growth is inconsistent with discipline, or vice versa. Discipline is inconsistent with growth. How do you grow the business? How do you double it in five years and double it again in five years and remain a disciplined investor? Look, it's always a worry. I, 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 don't, uh, I, I can't say we don't worry about that, but what we've found in past is that we can be disciplined and continue to grow the business because scale actually matters. And the businesses we buy today, what I can tell you are, because they're large, mm -hmm. are far, far better than we bought when we were smaller. Because we're buying from professional organizations who spent the time to build them up and they just need to sell them now for some reason. And, uh, and that's been to our advantage. But look, the bottom line is you have to, to be, we, our number one goal is downside protection protection of capital, a reasonable return, and making sure that our clients never lose money. None of that changes. None of that changes. If, we, if any of that is ever at compromise, we just don't grow. And, uh, and it's not happened in past, but, uh, but it's possible.